we're going to go over to Romans chapter 1, continue our study there. Just pick up on a few words. I call him along better than not native Spanish speakers. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't have been able to translate. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. We'll look at what we're going this morning. Here, the apostle is still building upon the thought of not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he says in verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for, they, or for God has shewed it unto them. So here Paul begins with our righteousness in Christ and he goes on to contrast that with the wickedness of man. Amen. Verse 17 he says, For therein, as that is in the gospel and especially salvation made effectual to us. He says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. That righteousness of God we see it in the Old Testament as standard of righteousness, but we don't ever see that standard being fulfilled. Right. So uh, we, we know that the law allowed for the sacrifices and offerings to atone for sin for a time because man could not keep the law fully. We get when Christ came, we see the perfect obedience to the law and the actual righteousness of God displayed. And he lived that perfectly righteous life and was able to atone for our sins forever. Amen. That is the first part of the righteousness of God being revealed through the gospel. But yet it's completely known unto us when he reveals himself to us when we experience salvation and that righteousness is imputed to us. That when he, that's when we are made just before him, when we're made right before him, when we are given the righteousness of Christ. Amen. And that's when it's fully revealed to us is when he puts that righteousness on us and takes our sin and put it upon Christ. Amen. We'll get more into that in chapters 3 and 4. I think, if I remember, the word righteousness is used something like 30 times in the book of Romans. So it's a, a reoccurring theme of righteousness of God and then applied to the saints. But we, we, we see through the law and through the gospel how that no one but Christ could truly possess that righteousness. Amen. And that it must be given to us by faith, as he goes on to say here, is revealed from faith to faith. That we can only know this righteousness of God by faith. Mm -hmm. can, it's not of our works. No, our works can never ascertain to the righteousness of God. They can never ascend us to that level of righteousness because our works, even the best of them, are tainted by sin. Amen. No, it's simply by faith that we can know the righteousness of God. I didn't write this in my notes, but I want to turn here and read in Philippians chapter 2, I believe it is. flesh, how he was 
Actually, a great Pharisee, how he was, and now as a man, a quote, good person, how he had right. much zeal, but it was not the right type of zeal. Amen. <laughs> Verse 7, though, he comes to this conclusion, he says, But what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ. Amen. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Amen. It was verse 9. He says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. And the Jews' religion, being a Pharisee, Paul was considered a very righteous man. They were very self-righteous, but right. Yet that righteousness was not enough to satisfy God, if you will. Mm -hmm. So he he was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised eighth day. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He had all that self-righteousness, but yet in the eyes of God, that was. Not good enough. Right. He says that he hoped to be found not having his own righteousness, but the righteousness of, which is by faith of Christ. Amen. And that's the righteousness which is revealed through the gospel and is made effectual through salvation to us. And that's what we're talking about here in verse 17 when he says, There is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That Salvation and the righteousness of God is by faith from beginning to end. Amen. That's not you have to do enough good works and then you'll be saved. There's not you have to you have faith and you have to maintain it by good works, but except for the righteousness that comes through Christ, it's completely a faith in Him. Amen. That part of that verse he says, as it is written. That is, in the back of chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. And the man who has been made right with God through salvation, the man who has been justified with God, he says he shall live by faith. That is, he, that life comes to him by faith, and it's really maintained and sustained by faith. Amen. We must live to God by faith. We can't do it in our own strength, our own power, and our own words, but we must live for Him by faith. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Again, Paul writing here in verse number 20, he's speaking of his new life in Christ. He says, Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. He says he's crucified with Christ, but it doesn't mean you no, know, he's literally crucified in the flesh, but yet he must kill his flesh every day, and he's dead to sin through Christ. You know, he says, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Mm -hmm. The new life we have is not in of ourselves, but it's through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, and he says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. We must live by faith. You're right. Or we are not serving God. Well, we certainly live in this flesh, as Paul says, but yet the flesh should not dominate our lives. The flesh should not rule our lives. And that is a big difference between true believers and empty professors. They You're right. are still ruled by the flesh. They are still driven by their corrupt nature. And yet, for us that have been born again, we can live by faith. Now, the life that's lived by faith is not always an easy one. As Amen. Opposed to what many will tell you today. We, we see throughout the scriptures examples of those living by faith. Hebrews 11 tells us of some of those great examples that we have. 
And many times they did great things, but also times they suffer as well. I think of Job in chapter 13, verse 15, and the, you could summarize living by faith in this one verse. He says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That no matter what may come, he was going to trust God. That's truly living by faith, isn't it? Amen. Knowing that whether it's seemingly good or seemingly bad, whether it's riches or poverty, whether it's possessions or nothing at all, that we have, as Christ said, not even a place to lay our head. Right. Yet he says he will trust him. We, at least in this country, have a, a problem with prosperity gospel preaching. And right. I know none of us would say we believe that everything's going to be you know, health and wealth and good times, but the thing sometimes we think is we're not blessed with God if everything doesn't just go our way. Right. Yet living by faith doesn't necessitate that everything has to go our way. That we trust God that no matter what may come, He works all things together for our good. Amen. And we go on to verse 18 back in our text. <laughs> it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This is in contrast to our previous verse of righteousness through Christ. Now he speaks of this wrath of God against unrighteousness. And the wrath of God that's his, his anger, his indignation, is in accordance with his righteousness and holiness. It's not like our anger often is. Our anger is often driven by other emotions and jealousy or right. covetousness or hatred, whatever it may be. Yet God can have a righteous anger mm -hmm. against sin and sinners. Amen. Well, Psalm 7 11 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. <clears throat> it says it's revealed from heaven, and it comes from God Himself that we, we see it very literally in several examples in the scriptures in the, the old world when God rained down water and destroyed the earth save so Noah and his family we see it when Solomon and Gomorrah when he rained down fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them Right. when he just opened up the earth and swallowed up Korah and that bunch and we will see it quite the same again at the end of this world and the present creation is burned up with the amount of heat. You know, many today think that God is just the love and rainbow and unicorns and fairy tales, but yet the God of the Bible, he does have a hatred for sin. Amen. And his wrath is just as much as his love, his, his righteousness and holiness demands justice for sin. And there's only two options. It's either we are either Christ took that upon him for us, or you will bear it to the end of yourselves throughout all eternity. Mm -hmm. He says it's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It's man's sin which incites the wrath of God. You're right. They continually transgress his law. That is what that's why he is angry with the wicked every day, because they continually and daily transgress his law and break right. his commands. Amen. Man acts as if the God is mean or unfair because of this, but it's their own wickedness that will bring the wrath of God upon them. Amen. From hell to the final judgment, even to the being cast into the lake of fire, all that will be not because God is quote mean or because God is some bully, but yet it will be because of their own sinfulness. Mm -hmm. So not getting too a, too much ahead of ourselves, a man will be without excuse when he stands before God. Amen. Well, he says that 
In the last part of that verse, it says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That means they, they hold it back, they restrain it. You know, they know the truth, but or at least they know of truth. Mm -hmm. Yet their unrighteousness overrides that, if you will. The, the man is consciously aware of God, and he knows right versus wrong mm -hmm. to some degree, but yet that depravity reigns within him. Right. Well, Adam and Eve, they, they perfectly knew God. And they come to know good versus evil. Through the fall, that wasn't completely lost, if I can say it that way. They, man throughout history has always known there is a God. They've always known of some idea of good versus evil. But yet they've always suppressed that due to their own wickedness. Mm -hmm. We see very evidently that man has known God throughout all of antiquity. You see man worshiping a God of some sort. Even the, what we call the Native Americans, the Indians, they they knew of a God. And that, you know, they were far and separated away from Abraham and Christ and or even the Muslims, and yet they even knew as much as a God was a spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, man knows about God, but he doesn't naturally know God. Amen. That's why you, you, you ought to be aware of someone who just says, I believe in God. But James say, the devils also believe in tremble. Mm -hmm. Just believing that there is a God is not equivalent to knowing God. You're right. It says that they hold the truth in unrighteousness. This is especially true for false religions and false professors who they have some knowledge of the truth, but yet they pervert it into unrighteousness. They ban some, whether purposely or just as tools of Satan, they try to restrain the truth of the Word of God by perverting something that's not. The Catholic Church is a good example of that. Exactly. Yet man said he knows about God, but yet because of the unrighteousness of him, he can never in and of himself believe in Christ, and he can never in and of himself be righteous before God. Go on to verse 19 here. He adds on to that and he says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Amen. Well, there are things which man can know about God. We mentioned that through nature we can see that there is a God. Man has a conscience which tells him. Deep down, that there is a God, there is good, mm -hmm. there is evil. So, atheism, atheism is not necessarily a new thing, but it is a, a more popular thing than it ever has been. Right. Man has always had evidence that there is a God. So, nature itself is a witness to that. Amen. And yet, just because they know of God doesn't mean that they know Him personally. Because mm -hmm. that which may be known of God is manifest in them, or that it's, it's evident in them, it's apparent in them, that they are aware that there is a God, and yet they don't submit to Him, they don't <coughs> yield themselves to Him. Because the natural man is bent against God, the natural mm -hmm. man is corrupt, Nature does not desire to serve God. It says, For God has showed it unto them. Mm -hmm. Except through these natural means of understanding that we mentioned, God has revealed himself unto man, so that man is without excuse. So we only get too ahead of ourselves, but that's what Paul kind of goes into in the next several verses. Mm -hmm. The man 
will not be able to stand before God and say, well, I didn't know there was a God, even the right. remote, most remote people of the nations. You know, there's down there in Guyana where, where the tribe is, there's native people you can't even go and talk to. Right. And yeah. that will be without excuse when they stand before God. Mm -hmm. Because God has, through his creation, revealed himself to his people. And yet, or should I say two people, but yet only only those who he has been pleased to save truly know who he is. Mm -hmm. Well, let's to consider real quick in Job chapter 32. Here, Job 32, verse number 8. Job is flying back to Elihu. And he says, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Amen. Man has a spirit. We know man is dead in trespasses and sins, but if he says God gives them an understanding. He, God gives them a, obviously he gives to us as people a great understanding of who he is. Get, even to the natural man, he gives an understanding that there is a God. Amen. That man will be accountable to God. Yet in their unrighteousness and their wickedness, they don't like to think that there is a God. Right. They don't like to think that they will be held accountable before God. Yet they will be without excuse when they stand before them. Amen. That's will, right. They will not be able to plead this ignorance or they, well, God, you're sovereign. What can I do about that? So man will be held fully responsible when he stands before God. That's what Paul is building up to here in these verses that yes, man is unrighteous, but yet man is going to be without excuse. Mm -hmm. That salvation only comes by faith, not by works or any other means. Hey, yes, God is pleased to bestow his righteousness upon those that believe in Christ, yet his full wrath will be poured out upon all the wicked. He said first in hell, and then when he comes back, to, I think if Paul describes it as a flaming vengeance mm -hmm. upon all those who don't believe. Amen. And then when that final judgment is pronounced and they are cast alive in the lake of fire to burn for all of eternity, yet that will be their just reward for their unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. So without getting too ahead of ourselves, we all are unrighteous before God. Amen. <laughs> We can't think that our, uh, we're going to be a good enough person that God's going to wink over sin for really every day that the wicked transgress the law, he is more and more angry with them. Amen. Thanks be to God for his long suffering, or he would have destroyed this earth a long time ago. You're right. It almost. It's hard for us to imagine his long suffering when we think of his righteousness and his holiness and how we, how much he hates sin, despises sin. Right. And he is still long suffering. Amen. And so we ought to be as well. We're sure there is coming a day when he will be long suffering no more and his full wrath will be poured out. Amen. So let's close with a thought that are you prepared for that day? Amen.